And so Alex will be speaking to how this land privatization or commonly known as enclosure is the structural foundation of the market economy. And this private land foundation traps most of us into dependence on an unsustainable growth economy as we struggle to meet the lifeline cost of rent or mortgage. And as a renter, and probably as some of you are on this call, I think we're very well aware of the crisis we're in, the housing crisis. When um, And then following on uh, will be Louise Captree hayes um, who's an associate professor um, and principal research fellow in the Institute of Culture and Society at Western Sydney University. She teaches and researches on sustainability and community-led housing and previously has led team projects on the potential of community land trusts in Australia. And currently she is leading a project on the values and benefits of Australia's affordable rental housing cooperatives. Um, so we will begin with Alex and then we'll follow with Louise and then we'll open up to Q&A. So, sit back, um, I'm going to uh, stop sharing and I'm going to throw it over to Alex if you'd like to share your screen. Do you have co-hosting? Thanks, Nat. Um, my name's Alex and I'm coming to you from the Blue Mountains um, today, which is uh, both Darik and Gunagar country. Um, it's really pertinent, um, the acknowledgement of country to my whole presentation really, and the notion of Indigenous um, connections to land because prior, as many of you will well know, prior to um, market notions of ec economy and development, um, there were older modes of economic operation at work. Um, and the oldest um, form of um, sort of Indigenous economy, not just to Australian Indigenous people, but to European Indigenous people were um, largely local types of collaboration on common land. Um, it would, you know, there's there's many sort of expressions of that local collaboration on common land, but there that that is an economic mode of operation in itself. And the point that I really would like to make um, tonight is that if we want degrowth and we see the real need for degrowth, that's kind of a paradigm shift type um, uh, proposition, because our current paradigm, which began with enclosures or the first privatisation of land, um, and then by privatising land forced us all into types of market um, servitude to try and work in the market so that we might earn money, so that we might buy or rent land. Uh, this, this new mode of capitalist economic operation uh, relies on profits and growth. Um, so if we want degrowth, that, that, that really requires us to look at other economic modes of thinking. And I'm gonna try and make that point tonight. I'm gonna try and um, talk about the way we really need a different type of relationship to land to free us from markets. Um, I'd love to hear more, I'd love to hear personal stories here tonight because I'm sure most of you, unless you happen to be lucky enough to maybe to inherit land or housing, have a story around this. I mean, you've probably recognised the need for degrowth being here tonight, the need for a contraction of, of your own life um, and consumption patterns, let alone the broader growth economy. But how do we do this when the struggle for rental or mortgage security drives us into markets in, in, in ways that it, it's very hard to be fussy about. And I, I want to talk a little bit about that. So how much dropping in to economic growth do we need to do in order to, you know, have degrowth in the suburbs and live out some of those dreams that we would like to live out? Um, we would need some land and housing security. What, what's involved, though, in that land and housing security? What I'm going to do tonight is I'm going to present just two or three slides very quickly, and then I'd like to share with you a little video that um, some students in the Sustainable Futures subject that I lecture in um, made together with me for the Beyond Growth Conference. It was actually showed at a UK roundtable in the lead up to the Beyond Growth Conference, trying to bring in this dimension of land privatisation and its implication for degrowth. So just a couple of slides. And um, the first one I wanted to, to talk to was this idea of affordable. 
In terms of degrowth, what does affordable really mean? In other words, how much housing debt or market engagement would be sustainable? To try and get a grip on that sort of a question, I, I really like to use this graph. It's from the United Nations Emissions Gap Report. Um, and what it's basically saying to us, I know there's a lot of, a lot of image here, um, is that we, most people in the global north, um, us, are in this top 10% of global income earners. According to the Global Wealth Report, um, anyone with a net wealth of around 162,000 US, oh, it's actually that's Australian dollars, 160, so a net wealth of around 162,000. If you have that net wealth, all of your um, you know, wealth combined, you're in the top 10 of global wealth holders, top 10% of global wealth holders. And if you happen to be in that top 10% of global wealth holders, and I know I certainly am, and most of us are, your, your carbon is up around the 20 tonnes um, per year mark, 20 tonnes of CO2 per year mark, okay? This equivalence was made in the United Nations um, Emissions Gap Report. It was made in, as well, Oxfam have made a really strong link between income and resource use and carbon um, use. So it's a very general, very ballpark attempt to understand the, these sort of macro ideas. But basically, most of us in the global north are in this top 10%. The goal that the UN has now given us in the emissions gap report is that we need to move from around 20 tonnes, and here in Australia, the average, I think, is 16 tonnes per person per year. That's the average. But in the global north, generally, it's around 20 tonnes. We need to move from that to around 2.1 tonnes per person per year. So that's, you know, for average global north people, that's a, you know, contraction of our lifestyles and our imp impact and resource use by about... 10 times. So it gives you a bit of an idea, doesn't it? Um, in fact, you can be in the top 1% with a net wealth of about 1.3 million and 20% and of Australians are in that top 1%. So, it's, you know, you might think of Elon Musk or someone when you think of the 1%, but actually some of us here tonight uh, may well be in the top 1% because, you know, you, th your net wealth, including real estate, can easily come to $1.3 million. So we're really over the limit, as most of you here tonight would well know, um, coming to a degrowth. So what does this mean in terms of affordability and housing? In a degrowth perspective, what does that mean? It mean if we're really looking at something like a tenfold um, reduction in order to leave a globally responsible lifestyle, a lifestyle 8 billion people could live and leave a planet for 10 billion people by 2050. This 2.1 tonne lifestyle has been given to us as a target to stay under 1.5 degrees warming by 2030. So degrowth, I think that's really helpful for framing the conversation around housing because it really gives us a sense, I think, of how much... Um, affordability in a degrowth sense and that's not much is it it's you know if, if you're if you if you it's sixteen thousand dollars net wealth really but if 162,000 is the top 10 percent a 10 percent a 10 times reduction on that it's a very small amount of wealth so what could housing look like with practically no money is the question i ask myself what could it look like well I think it could look like something really interesting, but it really takes us back to these pre-market ideas of land and housing, pre-commodified, pre-market ideas, which of course then changes the whole economic mode of operation where we have private land and paid work as the market mode of operation and the indigenous mode, the pre-market idea is land commons and local collaboration we might need some kind of a shift back and that would require land commons. Can I just show you a, a small video? It's under 10 minutes and that'll take me up to my 15 minutes from the day which is students and myself sharing um, this idea and what it could possibly look like. So I'll reshare um, because I think I need to for a video. Thanks, Alexa. Did you wanted to say some final words to finish? Yeah,
I hope everybody uh, was able to hear and see that okay and, and that it, the message came across um, okay. Um, there were a few questions coming in I saw too. The, I just want to say one last thing before um, I hand, hand things over. There, the, the call to action I, I'm really in, encouraging and, and wanting to see is, is actually what the Greens are starting to do now, which is pointing to uh, cities like Vienna, which are showing incredible, which have an incredible history of public housing. Um, as many of, as 60% of people being in social forms of housing over there and an incredible heritage over there. It's called at cost rental housing, where much of the, um, uh, you, know, you know, there's, there's percentages of incomes, n never more than 25% of income paid in rent for social housing um, in those states. And um, it's, it really it really works as a as a much larger infrastructure and it frees frees people from markets largely and this is the key point I really wanted to try and pass on which is how do we free ourselves from markets there's so much talk about changing our attitudes and our culture um, in terms of how much work we do how much consumerism we're involved in but this economic structure particularly of of privatisation of land, how much cultural change can we really expect when that pressure is just such a powerful economic determinant? Um, I think sometimes we might gaslight ourselves in thinking, why can't I be more, less consumeristic and so on, when really this powerful economic structure is driving us into markets in ways that we can't really be all that fussy about. I mean, I'm an academic and the way I pay my rent is you know is from stu from students flying in internationally, which is very carbon intensive, and the way universities collect revenue, which is largely commodities. It's things like iron ore and gas and coal that they rely on for their funding. So that's how I pay my rent, and I'm a sustainability academic. How ironic is that? Um, but that's how I have to pay my rent and keep a roof over my family's head. So I guess the point I'm trying to make is until we question this very first, um, uh, this very first privatisation, we, we, we are somewhat structurally locked into markets and growth and governments will serve that agenda whilst people's survival imperative is to keep that roof over their heads. And that survival imperative will even be experienced as more powerful than something like climate change because it's so personal and it's so immediate. They will want those industries, they'll need them to step, you know, keep offering them opportunity whilst though that opportunity keeps the roof over their head. So this is the, the sort of the, the tension we face. So that, that's it from me. Thank you, Nat. Thanks, Alex. Uh, it's really, really fantastic presentation. A lot there to, to think about. And I really recommend if anyone's got any questions or comments, please throw them into the chat. Um, I think one thing that I'd like to say, and you know, just going back to this connection to land and humans, and particularly the way things were before sort of enclosure and privatization of land, is we're only talking about a really, really small part of human history. And I think this is the one thing that we forget. I have the I've, I work in Papua New Guinea a lot, um, where there's something like 85% customary land ownership. And every time I come back, and look, some people, you know, I'm not saying it's perfect there. You have a kleptocracy, you have corporations, you've got colonization, you've got all these things. But in communities, even in the settlements, when I come back from Papua New Guinea to Australia, I have this unbearable feeling of loneliness, even though I have family and community, because they are so connected to their land and to their community and grow their food. Even in the settlements, they're still growing food. And um, I think that that's always been really kind of in my face, also working here with First Nations. Um, but now I'm going to go to Louise, which is a really sort of great follow on um, presentation in terms of, you know, I guess you're working in some really practical ways of uh, cooperative housing. Um, so I'll throw over to you, Louise, to start your presentation. Did you need slides as well? Uh, yeah, that's fine. I'll, I'll do a share in a sec. Okay, great. Cool. So thanks so much. And yeah, no, it's, and nice work, Alex. Seriously, that's so cool seeing the students like in there doing the do. That's, that's just, yeah, awesome stuff. Um, 
and yeah, I'm just want to um, say that I'm joining from Gadigal country today. Um, so uh, east of where Alex is, um, down uh, on the Sydney plain, on the, the beautiful country here, and just want to uh, shout out to elders past and present and any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander folk with us today. And obviously, land is so core to what we're talking about here. So I will um, jump in without further ado. So. I was asked to talk about community land trusts, which are, you know, probably my first property love. <laughs> I came into them through looking at exactly the issue that Alex has just spelt out so clearly, which is this, this question of how do we just have thriving livelihoods for human and non-human life? How do we get beyond this, this growth thing that's just so destructive to so much of our world? Um, and the more I looked at things around the simple mecha, you know, mechanics of growing food and trying to live in a city, the more I realized, wow, land and shelter are really the, the thing here, particularly the land question. So I actually came to Community Land Trust through looking for viable urban agriculture or urban food systems um, and finding the CLTs in the United States. So that's what I'm going to be focusing on, but it's really in terms of thinking about, well, what does this what do the principles bound up in them and the mechanisms that they're using offer in terms of how we move towards the sorts of things that Alex has just spelt out in terms of this commons understanding of land uh, as a, and, and you know, stepping into a degrowth space uh, through that. So anyway, without further ado, because um, really they, they're based on where they came from is this idea of just taking land out of the market and then how uh, how you can then do housing on that basis. So they've got a really clear but broad definition. They're basically any non-profit entity that's holding title to property to provide perpetual affordability and community benefit. So they can do that you know, in partnership with the state or as standalone community organisations or what have you, but it's just, we're a non-profit, we're here for perpetuity and we're here for community benefit. And what that means is that if, you know, instantly so, well, where's our community? Who's our community? Who is making this decision uh, around what we want to do here? And what does benefit mean? So I think as we move from historically, in terms of property, thinking that benefit meant profit, <laughs> if benefit means something like degrowth, the thriving of non-human life, then this is a vehicle for foregrounding that. Uh, and so shifting the value register away from, this has got to be about making money. Um, and I think that's, you know, for me, that's where the resonance is um, because each CLT is in a process of defining these according to context and then developing their programs accordingly. So who are we housing and on what terms? What's our housing doing? What's its impact uh, on the world and on ourselves? So as I said, that core principle of taking land out of the market and then basing and balancing the individual's household need with community or societal needs. So you know, yes, this is your home, um, but because you're in a relationship with the community land trust, you're in the relationship with the community, including future generations. So it's it's starting to re-embed home and housing uh, as a social infrastructure rather than you know, this is your private commodity. It's like you're actually now enmeshed in a series of relationships. And so part of that is then looking at what that means over time and all of that's written into then the agreements that are in place you can do this you can't do that you know these are your rights these are your obligations so it's again foregrounding that social interpretation of of law and property rather than this sort of modernist in, individualist un, you know, understanding that we've had that's like no it's yours it's your castle blah 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 it's like no this is actually a social thing um, and because of that, their membership in their board is very consciously constructed to balance those diverse needs and voices as an ongoing forum to talk about what's community, community benefit mean to us now, what does it mean to us now, so that the, the mission of the organisation uh, stays true but is able to change over time as you know, circumstances change. So they speak to local gaps in their local systems, so you'll see co-op housing, rental housing, you know, co-housing, food gardens, blah, 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 anything that community has said. And then whatever conditions are in place in terms of that relationship between you as you know, someone in your home and the community, 
that stays in place. So if, if you own your home in this situation, which is always you know, price limited and, and all of those sorts of things, or if you're renting or what have you, every time that uh, you know, there's an inheritance event or you relet, those conditions travel across that. So it's just renewing and renewing and renewing in terms of upholding that relationship. And so because of that dialogue, you get all sorts of things happening on land. You'll see community gardens, childcare, aged care, youth employment programs, blah, 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 blah. And that's because of that forum of saying, well, what does our community need and what does benefit mean to us? So they'll refer to themselves as developers who don't go away, um, which I think is a really crucial thing because they're there in the long haul. And that means that they tend to build better homes um, because they're not going to just build garbage <laughs> for people to then try and work out how to live in. It's very much about, well, how do we build this as a legacy? What is it that we're doing? So I think in terms of those questions of impact, um, you know, having that longer vision and that commitment really helps bring to the foreground more appropriate forms of housing that aren't environmentally destructive. As I say, anything you can do on land, you can do on a CLT. And I've got the photo of the Dudley Street Neighbourhood uh, Initiatives Board down the bottom there um, to show the sorts of things I'm talking about. They've got a board of 34 and it's um, allocated according to the demographics of the region. Um, and um, so I've got this direct proportional representation. What happens on city land, what happens on vacant land, and you've got this community based vision for the entire region getting written into into city policy. Um, so extraordinary sort of things that happen. They've been around for about 30 odd years. So we've seen this you know, translation across um, multiple jurisdictions, you can see the numbers there and sort of their growth um, sort of showing that this is you know, something that is obviously resonating um, with people triggered by issues around affordability, but actually stepping more into that understanding of how do we actually steward a commons and translate that into decent housing. So I'll have a look at some examples and then we'll do a bit of a wrap up. Um, so this is Champlain in um, Burlington, Vermont. They've got over 4,000 members, two and a half thousand homes, over three counties, uh, every form of tenure possible. It's all permanently affordable. And the really nice thing is the ways that you can talk about affordability. And I'm really glad that you mentioned that point, Alex, in terms of, well, what does that mean? And the nice thing with you know, playing around with some of these settings in properties, you can say, well, we'll index it to income or we'll index it to something other than GDP or this expectation of gain. So if that starts to go down, then the property values can go down as well. So there's mechanisms for deflating the market um, and, you know, but without compromising people's stability in their homes. Um, so I think there's some really nice ways to play around in there. Um, but they've also got community and commercial spaces so you've got a bike garage where they'll fix up bikes for cheap and make them available for free and a food shelf and a queer space and refugee center and aged care center etc cetera, etc cetera. um you know, i think they're the second biggest landholder in the city now we've seen them jump the ditch the uk has i think established 300 community land trusts in the past 15 years or something they're just going gangbusters but the really exciting stuff is in scotland because um, the government actually enacted uh, a Land Reform Act, um, which actually gave crofting communities the right to reclaim any land that was being held by absentee landlords. So crofting's like old school agricultural, um, you know, commons-based agricultural practices. And so the crofting communities actually got the power to get their land back as commons. Um, and there's, it's all tied up in the independence movement with Scotland as well. And so there's been these subsequent acts as well. Um, and this sort of whole community right to buy act, which I suggest you look up uh, if you haven't um, come across it. And I want to focus on the Isle of Egg. Um, so they um, got hold of their land. Um, they uh, raised 1.5 million amongst themselves and also further afield and they bought it and it's now held by community. I mean, obviously it'd be nice for them to pay for it. So there's obviously a, a reparations issue there, but they did get it back. And the, the issue, the nice thing about the right to buy is that the landlords, the absentee landlords, so these are like, you know, English lords, you know, who own Scottish land and go up there every year to shoot pheasants or whatever. Um, they couldn't say no, they couldn't actually refuse the purchase. So it's an incredibly powerful act, which is, which is really quite 
a wonderful thing to behold. Um, so um, they've got a community trust that owns it and they've set up three subsidiary companies. And so one of them's renewable energy. One of them's now uh, got a shop, a post office, a tea room and a craft shop. So previously the place was basically just a totally vacant uh, hunting ground. Um, so it's now basic services, they're all community owned and run. Uh, and they've also started building housing, they're doing some infrastructure, and uh, they've actually had population come back onto, onto the far, onto the island. And they've now got a shared equity scheme as well. And so people can buy homes and build homes with no land costs, but if they sell, it all goes back into the trust. So I'd probably put some tighter restrictions on that myself. But anyway, I think there's some really interesting sort of nuts and bolts to play around with in terms of what they've been able to do. And there's their wind farm and some of their beautiful cows. Um, so in terms of degrowth, I was thinking, well, okay, how does this sit with regard to degrowth? And so I went digging around in the degrowth principles. So I say, well, okay, how do I, where is there a, a synergy here? And so in terms of like frugal abundance, which is this sweet spot between not growth nor austerity and thinking differently about the economy. So it's not this logic of scarcity and winners and losers and all those sorts of horrible things. Um, and I think that's, that's a really nice spot that I think you know, a lot of the CLTs occupy because they're meeting needs. And then if there is surplus, they're putting that back into, well, what does our community need? How do we just keep doing this in perpetuity and into what the community sees as productive? So taking it out of a speculative register and into a broader value register. And if we think about the need in degrowth to decolonize the imaginary, um, that's absolutely pivotal i think in what clts have been doing because of this fundamental understanding that you don't buy and sell land our land is a common legacy it's it's our you know it's it generated us it birthed us and you know, we are of the land you don't carve that up and sell it and so that's very much where the clts are sitting in terms of their treatment of land and i think there's definitely and you know of led projects looking at CLTs for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander uh, housing because of that resonance. And I think there's definitely a way to use them as a step towards a vehicle of colonization. You can see the example there, the uh, Wyoke tribe uh, in the USA who have actually just set up um, a CLT as a land back, a land back uh, uh, measure. So then if we're thinking about conviviality is our third principle of degrowth. And they're talking about in this not just enjoying each other's uh, company. And I've got Gus Newport there, who's recently passed, who is just an absolute legend, but anyway. Um, but also applying the same approach to the tools. So we sound out, surround ourselves with convivial tools rather than the relatively useless devices that pour out of factories to be advertised and sold as commodities. And that ethic I see um, throughout the CLTs that I've worked with, there's the, space that they generate, not just in terms of the ethic of the entity, but the approach and the ethic with which they build their homes, taking it out of that speculative register and very much into this, how do we actually just focus on people and place and perpetuity? It, it, it just changes the logic of, of housing uh, greatly. And so lastly, then, uh, as the fourth principle, this sort of idea of open relocalization, which is sort of really that spanning between the global and the local of you know, these place-based entities and these place-based approaches um, and this idea of stewardship that there's deeply globally embedded and engaged and we see you know these sort of ways in which the the clt networks and and movements are doing that um, but particularly i had to have gus up there because i think as one of the sort of clt um, titans <laughs> oh, he's just such a stellar human and it was such a loss when he passed and um i'm just going to take a moment to read from his obituary um it says he talked about his accomplishments from civil rights activism to groundbreaking political initiatives to far-sighted community economic development programs to global solidarity and elder statesman leadership and i think that that ethic of taking you know, property relations how we live in how we live in place, how we live in you know, as embedded community and ecological entities into this space of you know, states' personship, let's say, 
but thinking about ourselves as global citizens in that way and these absolutely unshakable um, stances of solidarity, I think, is really key and something that, yeah, we can hopefully all aspire to. So on your Gus, you're a legend. Um, and I'm going to end there because that's enough from me and it's much more fun to have a chat. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And there's been um, a bit of dialogue in the chat, which is great. Um, and I'm thinking maybe I'll, I'll just go back. We'll open it up to Q&A. So if you do have any other questions or comments, please do please do throw them in um, to the chat. Um, <clears throat> so there was, uh, just going back to you, Alex, there was a question here from uh, Marita what about mortgage-free house landholders? How can they help? Mortgage-free is in owning the property outright. I'd say that's, yeah. Um, well, you know, there, of course, I'm, I'm not speaking in absolutist terms when I talk about public housing being um, really core to a, few, a sort of a degrowth future. There's people, obviously, who have secured their ownership and they can certainly help um you know with with the advocacy around things like public housing there's a big movement currently going on the greens held up the labor's policy, housing policy for this very reason and they're pointing directly at cities like um vienna as an example of where australia can go and these are all fairly well landed people um creating great advocacy for public housing and um it's you know it's not an eye it's not a it's not mutually exclusive. There's going to be all sorts of tenure types in the world and there can certainly be. Um, the question really is for the, for the you know, vast bulk of the world's population who's currently striving to achieve some kind of security, it's you know, four-fifths of the world's people live in relative you know, degrees of insecurity and don't have housing ownership. Um, and you know, there's quite high and so, and are seeking it through market, you know, options. If we are, if we have really reached limits to growth, if we've reached limits, and we do need options that give people security that don't require more market and more growth, then I think we do need to really get behind pretty large scale types of public housing um, options, things like community land trust too, which can obviously be part of a mix of a, of a very different type of security achieved not through growth, but through um, reclaiming pre-market types of economic operation, which are commons and locally collaborative types of development. So that's, I hope that answers the question. I'm, I'm not, Louise, would you add to that? I'm not sure. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, all of the above. Um, <laughs> and um, I, I think the power of advocacy in this space is huge. Um, and I think you know, the reason we're seeing uh, an uptick in concern around affordable housing is because people who own housing are now realising that their kids won't be able to afford housing. So, oh, oops, it's an issue now. Um, so I think you know, making use of a crisis in that way. But there's also really practical things in terms of um, if they're in a position, obviously they can't do it, <laughs> while they're with us, but things like bequests as well, and um, actually you know, making a decision to take their own property out of a market system. And I know, you know there are people who have done that and said, you know what, we're gonna use this to start a non-profit, or we're gonna leave this to a non-profit, or we're going to actually, you know, and making that decision to change their own property uh, into a decommodified form. Um, so yeah, there are, there are numerous ways that people can can help out and get inventive and yeah, apart from you know the usual of pestering your politicians until they do something <laughs> and joining things and yeah, it's really at the heart of decolonisation. This stuff, I mean, land back. I mean, that's. Mm. The... Mm. I guess um, there, there's a bit of a conversation going in the chat um, and some I guess some good questions, which is. Um, and clearly the pe people talking in the chat are very much activists around, you know, changing our housing system. But there, there's a couple of questions. Howard, I know you've sort of been pointing towards your distrust of some of these initiatives and, and them not being government-led. 
um, I know that then goes against the whole decolonization kind of thing, because as far as I'm concerned, <laughs> government's illegal um, in my own kind of way of seeing Australia, so-called Australia. But um, I guess that's a really important question, you know, um, in terms of, you know, there was another comment here, I think, by um, Marita, uh, you know, how can these public housing be bought by sold to private people who are not hip with the vibe of community housing so you know like there's an attractiveness or there's a type of people that might be drawn to that um so yeah I guess a couple of questions there is you know uh, are there concerns sometimes when it isn't government-led uh what are the positives of government-led what are the cons of government-led in terms of what your practices and what you're looking at um and I guess maybe some examples would be great I'm throwing to both of you in this question. <laughs> Sorry. All right, who's going first? <laughs> um, you could go first, Louise, if you'd like. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, yeah, look, I don't think I don't think there's a singular right way of doing this. Um, I think that the concerns, and I, I think the concerns raised about community housing here uh, in the chat. Um, are valid, and I think it's because it's it's not actually community housing; it's it's non-profit housing in a corporate model, um, and it's it's affordable housing, but it's not led by community. Um, and I think that's where we're seeing the community housing sector here, sort of in a strange space, because they they don't have a community voice in their membership. The the, the co-ops do to an extent. Um, particularly somewhere the co-op itself is the community housing provider, but where the co-ops are under a community pro housing provider, there's very limited capacity for community to actually have a voice. And so the difference that we see with um, the large scale, large scale um, non-profit co-op sectors or, or the large scale CLTs is a massive community voice. We're not talking 20 people with vested interests who can vote it into weirdness. Um, you know, like with Champlain, 4,000 members. Um, it's legally constituted to have to keep being a non-profit community-based housing provider. Um, so it's the mission, and it's because they've gone wrong in every conceivable way over the past sort of 60 years in the US. So they've managed to screw the legals down really tight. So it's like, no, we can't misbehave. Um, you know, even if the thing collapses financially, it has to go to another community based nonprofit organisation. So they've, they've learnt the hard way to not let themselves get taken over by nepotism or weird stuff, people flipping things for their own profit, you know, all those kinds of things. So, um, and there's no reason why you can't make state housing act in the same way. Um, you know, we could have title red still lying with the state and then we'll just work out a way to bring a stronger community voice in to have uh, that representative uh, mechanism in there. So, and that's, that's the stuff that we're largely missing in Australia at the moment is we don't have these models where there is a strong community voice. Um, you know, we're starting to see things and, and Alex has talked about, um, you know, the work that he's been doing as well. You know, we are starting to see them, but that historically is something that um, we've not been great at in the social and, and community housing space. So it's how we draw these principles in and just really bed them down so that people can't do silly things. And we've got lots of lessons that we can learn about what silly things have looked like elsewhere before and how to avoid them, <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> Over to you, Alex. I'll just say Great. really quickly, um, I think at the heart of what I've certainly been trying to say and what I heard in Louise's presentation too is this idea of land as a common and, and social good. It wasn't, it's not a product of the market or the state for that matter. Land is a, like air and water, it's, it's you know, one could argue if you have a right to life, you have a right to the things nature you know, provides to sustain life. And um, in my thinking, largely, that should be facilitated in non-private hands. That, that's a, you know, I take what Nat, Nat's saying in, in absolute terms too, this, this is a government in some ways without legitimacy, yeah, you know, um, but I would always seek that land stays 
as common as possible and is facilitated in the most appropriate way. And it, the, the only public housing and, and that heritage that we have of public housing, to me, that's about as close to um, the best thing. We're, it's the best we've got um, in terms of land being held as a common good and as a social good. And unfortunately, what we've seen under neoliberalism and the transferring over to social, the umbrella of social housing has been a sort of a some attempt to relinquish the responsibility of the state for facilitating common land and to hand it back to the charity sector as, as a kind of a non-profit charity um, activity. Um, whereas my, my, you know, I think there's room for everything. I'm not, I'm not talking about only one model, but my ideal is to have land held as common as possible. And to me, that's a government enterprise. I, I would like to see the government improved and the voice could be a good step in that direction, certainly. Um, but I, I um, yeah, I, I do believe public land should be, is the closest thing we've got to commons and that the facilitation by governments, not the ownership is the way to go. There's, it's, it's, the, it's the best antidote we've got to nimbyism and things like that where, and the degrowth principles of, um, you know, sustainable, appropriate ethical land use, um, I think can best be facilitated by the most macro, the biggest governance um, body. And, and to me, that's a, that's a state idea so that's how i think about it um not account, not discounting the the room for other models and, and space so. mm. um so. yeah i mean i think you know it's a big question there's, there's a big question um by marita uh no no is it marita let me sorry uh so amy how can we realistically see this being implemented at a scale that matches the current status quo and i think you're sort of Talking to that, um, and earlier on in the chat, um, Mark put in um, exactly sort of, you know, how do we transition from a culture of private home ownership and investment in housing for capital gains to what you both are talking about? Um, and he's put a link there, um, which discusses town planning rebellion, which is not something I've heard of. Um, uh, and Mark has hoped that maybe we can add that to the conversation, um, whether both of you have any thoughts about that or or know much about the town planning rebellion. I'll put the link here that Mark has put in back into the chat so people can have it. I'd just like to say that uh, Samuel Alexander and I wrote an article in Australian Political Economy recently on a strategy in this regard. And um, we're really seeing, you know, the, what we're seeing in the Australian housing crisis and what's happening globally, the space is open and there is already, you know, as I was saying earlier, government legislation federally is being held up by the Greens on this very issue. The response has is not appropriate. The, the 500 million a year that's going to come from the 10 billion um, investment, it's just, it's going to do nothing to solve our housing crisis. And the crisis is getting, you know, we're starting to see signs um, that it, it, it's, it, it's going to have political momentum like we saw just before the golden age of public housing where more and more people start you know getting very concerned about the state of affairs and i think public housing is increasingly being talked about as the answer to that and if movements like the degrowth movement could throw their energy behind noting the overlap between housing and and degrowth because there's a powerful overlap which i've tried to talk about tonight um and and socialist groups too, many of whom, you know, have a Marxist heritage of looking at, at you know, at non-privatisation forms of land. I think this is a peak issue for the left, in my mind, getting behind public housing. And I just think there's huge potential for big things to happen in that space, uh, particularly as we see um, mechanisation of labour, so less, and we see um, globalisation of labour, we see all sorts of, we saw environmental limits to industry, What's going to happen? People are talking about a UB, UBI as a response to that. Well, that also requires huge revenues from government and more and more economic growth. But what about a, you know, a universal basic land access, public housing as the basis for giving people back security? That's not market dependent. And it's not about unemployment either, which I saw one comment make. It's about a different type of employment. 
it's about the sort of employment public tenants are already involved in, in things like public tenant participation programs, localised share economy, food production, resource sharing and repair, house maintenance. In the UK, there's house building. That's a different type of employment um, which can happen in public land and, and there can be a real abundance and productivity in that space. And it's a localization, it's a broad based skill development. It's all these indigenous themes on common land. It's um, uh, more collectivism over individualism. It's sort of a, a parallel economy could emerge out of this space. And I think the government settings are already there for that. Mm. And I think food is there for that. So yeah. there's a transition strategy discussed in the Australian Political Economy article, which I'll, I'll share. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I think there's, I mean, and there's a lot of you know, chat going on as well around your current policy settings. And absolutely, we know that things like negative gearing, capital gains tax exemptions, you know, we, we know all the big levers that have been laid down in the Henry Tax Review and that both of the major parties just will not touch. Um, and I think that we're seeing, like Alex said, voter sentiment um, just changing and saying that's, that's not good enough. Um, and you know the 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 Greens are right to hold up um, policy and to demand better. And um, you know the noise that's coming around the um, housing affordability future fund. It's it's not even a commitment to actual cash. It's this sort of oh, if we get the money, you know, then we'll start dribbling it back out into the sector. I mean, this stuff is just not good enough anymore. And we're seeing that. And we're seeing that in how people vote. Um, and we see these sort of articles <laughs> that I just laugh when I read them, you know, and um, I've got kids in the sort of 17 to, to 25 bracket who just wheeze, you know, when they read this stuff. It's like, oh, my goodness, the Liberal Party is losing young votes. How are they going to get them back? And it's like, you're not. You're just not. <laughs> like, those days are over. Um, and I think that, you know, so there's this, and as part of that, you know, the question there around how do we change the culture, like, absolutely the cult the cult of home ownership in australia historically but only post-war we've got to remember this is new we have had a legacy of phenomenal public housing and understanding it as an investment in our own society and an investment in the social good you know this idea that public housing is somehow a, a drain or a tax on us or yeah, you know, that's new and it's weird and it's freakish. You know, we've got a longer legacy of being absolutely proud in our public housing. And this cult of home ownership is really new. And it's it's totally reinforced by all these vested interests, all those make makeover shows and the fact that real estate.com is owned by, you know, major, I can't remember if it's Rupert who owns that, but, you know, there's these massive vested interests all trying to keep this thing, you know, afloat, even though it's, you know, hemorrhaging and, and sinking. But the thing that gives me hope is that we, many things do, but there's this one thing that we did um, as one of the Community Land Trust projects was we actually ran a bunch of focus groups uh, in Melbourne um, about, yeah, with young would-be home buyers who were trying to get into the home ownership market. They had their deposit, they were looking, you know, they're good to go. And so we talked them through all of these resale restricted products um and you know you won't get you know this is what you know your agreement's going to be and blah 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 um and expecting people to sort of go well well i don't know about that because there'd been some other research done that talked about shared equity in a really weird way and made it just sound awful um and, and everyone who they spoke to about it was like oh i don't want that and it's like well i'm not surprised because they made it sound like this really in your face Soviet kind of oppression of all of your rights kind of stuff and we just talk through okay look you've been in partnership with an entity you give away this this is what you get you know and once people heard hang on you mean it's it's mine and I can live here and I can leave it to my kids um they were like where do, where do I sign you know and the stuff about capital gains or am I going to get my equity back or blah 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 that just didn't come up as a priority for people and we gave them plenty of opportunity to talk about it and it was only after they'd exhausted all of the stuff about i just want to be able to stay here i just want to be able to send my kids to school i want to be part of this community i want to live near my family blah 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 you know um so i think that we're seeing shifts in terms of what people want from their housing and at the moment the models that are stepping into that space are these really horrible for-profit 
um, co-housing things um, where it's like, oh, you know, millennials don't need their own bathrooms. That means we can squeeze them in like sardines and charge them mega bucks. Let's do that. Um, rather than opening it up into, hey, there's an opportunity here to start looking at really intelligently and sensitively done, you know, co-housing options that are, you know, affordable in perpetuity that are, you know, whether it's held by the state or a non-profit or what have you, like, I think there are avenues emerging that aren't just, oh my God, I've got to get on that property ladder. But if we don't have them visible and available to people as possibilities, then, you know, they will just go to what's on offer. Um, so, you know, there's a, a bit of a, there's a bit of a, a push on to open the space up and just start to understand we've got more options. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I think just going back to you, Alex, you know, I guess you were talking about housing and degrowth and how these need to really come together. And I think actually when we're talking degrowth, we're talking about a lot of different sectors as well. And there, there's a question there from, um, excuse me, Louise, and I hope I'm reading this right, Louise, but how can we ad adequately respond to the climate and living crisis through housing? So I guess as we are, you know, moving in, talking about degrowth, we're constantly, we're in a really big change geopolitically, but also environmentally. We have all these converging crises, you know, globally and also nationally and locally. Um, so is public housing a more realistic thing to focus on as a top-down approach it, as top-down approaches are necessary at this point that's the second part of that question yeah well I, I think so yeah but mm -hmm. I think you know we know I mean I think we've all shown I mean I've certainly shown interest in this movement because we know that at the hub of all of these social and environmental problems there's something at the very core structural core that's and you know these problems are popping up like whack-a-mole you know like plastic in our oceans climate you know loss of you know mass biodiversity collapse all these things are popping up and i think what i love about this movement in degrowth is we see at the base of these problems is this perpetual growth that we're we're, we're seeing the more and more three percent growth even in affluent countries like australia where we're trying to grow 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 now the housing issue is really at the heart of that um, we saw during COVID, you know, with, with shutdown of industries like tourism, um, we saw people straight away in housing under housing threat. Um, 60,000 workers, um, you know, all of a sudden unable to work in tourism. We saw people in danger of not being able to pay their rents and mortgages. Now, here's the tension. It's great for degrowth that the tourist industry <laughs> hit a wall because we know it's one of the most affluent industries. It's the one of the most unnecessary in industries and it's incredibly carbon intensive. Only a very small fraction of the world have ever been on a plane. I think it's less than 5%. And we know it's very carbon privileged. It's perhaps the most carbon privileged thing you can do. But yet, if you stop that industry, people are in all of a sudden in housing dire straits. So how can housing, um, how can we even talk about degrowth if it's going to put people into such peril? Well, we need different structures and institutions of housing. We need public housing. We need to reclaim commons. Um, the market began with privatisation of land. Marx called it primitive accumulation, the first privatisation. That was the way the owners of capital first seized control of the of, of capital is, is to enclose land that's and spread through colonization if we want degrowth if then we have to reclaim that foundation from the market that's just the it's the it's the natural um uh break of that cycle we can't ask people in retail, in tourism, in commodities, in all these industries that people use to survive and pay their mortgages and rents to give up on those industries whilst those industries are keeping the roof over their heads. We can't. It's just not politically or socially appropriate. We need to give them a pathway out of that dependence and public housing largely in reinvented and reframed ways um, 
could be that path and the political mood is for public housing. And mm. I just think it would be wonderful for the degrowth movement to join what the Greens are doing now and others in, in getting behind um, this push. Because it's, I, I mean, the Greens could really use the degrowth perspective here because obviously they, they haven't quite seen the limits to growth. Um, and so, yeah, the convergence of this stuff I see um, as being really possible, especially as we reach ever increasing limits to growth. We just had the hottest mm. July in 25,000 years. I mean, my God, you know, we are, there's changing times coming. Yeah. And yeah. Actually, just Louise, I'm just sort of pointing to that. Um, oh, what was I going to say? Um, I guess, you know, going back to what you said, you know, I sort of said this is a very tiny period of time in humanity, but then you also brought it back even smaller to go, well, you know, just think about World War II and what came out of that. And I guess there's a question here, you know, um, like, do you think that land such as churches, state and local government ought to be held as commons, such as by community land trust, rather than being sold mm -hmm. privately? Um, I guess, you know, as we move forward and there is more need for more housing and I think there's there's a few comments in here about negative gearing and people having their third and fourth houses and renting it out or Airbnbs you know we know that exists and we know that's created really terrible situations particularly well, everywhere but in a lot of small towns around Australia as well um yeah so I guess you know is there is the part of this actually pushing for some of those spaces to be handed over to community land trusts as well or some other form, some other form that is basically is community, back to the community. Yeah, well, I think any any sort of, um, particularly where it's been a gift, like with the churches and, and what have you, any, any, and there are churches and other you know, faith-based organisations that are looking at, well, how do we actually start to use our land in ways that serve the common good? Um, and so I, I think that, yeah, that's absolutely something that should be on the um, table. Um, and I think the, um, the, I mean, the Airbnb thing, that's that's just such a fraught and, pro and vexatious issue because there are people now using that as their income. And so, yeah, you know, there are regional communities where they're getting absolutely hammered with un unaffordability because of Airbnb. And when councils try to implement caps or restrictions then they get pushback from their rate payers who are like but i use that for my income and you're now saying i won't have an income so we we really need to be thinking through how we think about housing justice and and i think to get to the question that came up before about how do we how do we think about housing in the context of climate change because i you know just finished writing a chapter on this actually and wondering and it builds a bit on an article I wrote in the conversation that got me in real trouble because Breitbart came for me and said that I wanted to see the end of property and and I was like I had this like hate pile on from Breitbart which is like yes I've made it <laughs> but um um because I was saying the property I don't think our property system is fit for purpose like it's it's I mean apart from the fact that it's doing this horrific thing of carving up land and buying and selling it like that's a thing you could do i think we're moving into times where having you know this, this idea that i've got my home and it's bricks and mortar and it's solid and it's secure and it's like oh whoops it's been washed away or it's burnt down and the insurance companies get into the point where like you know we're not going to insure anymore and so all of these things that were holding that up are actually starting to come apart at the seams and so I, I, in a way, it's starting to show that this sort of capitalist take on dwelling is a liability. You know, it's, it's, it ties you into a thing, and as Alex has so brilliantly shown, ties you into having to buy in, having to go to that job, you know, to just keep that thing going. And then if that even can't perform its basic purpose as you know, housing you <laughs> as climate change intensifies, I think it really just shows this This is really not up to the task. And so how we think about our right to dwell and absolutely, Alex, you know, being born, you've got the right to be here, you know, and how do we actually take that seriously? And if people then need to start moving on mass 
which we're already seeing, we're already seeing climate migrations. And as we start to see that happening more and more, you know, and towns just not getting rebuilt. Um, and we've seen, you know, in the US, there's buyback programs and there's places where the government has stepped in and said, we're not going to rebuild this town. This is now a wetland. We're going to move all of you somewhere else. Yeah, we're starting to see it. We've, we've, there's papers going around, white papers going around on retreat policies. And I think we need to be thinking differently about how we actually accommodate ourselves and accommodate human and non-human life in ways that aren't, you know, you've got to stump up cash to get title to this place. It's like, no, what is it that gives you how, how do we recognise our right to be here as communities um, and to be looking after each other? I think there's a care element that's got to come into this that can be flexible, that can be mobile, that's respectful, and that's about taking care rather than enclosing and capitalising and all these daft things. But anyway, sorry, I've gone way off track, but it's just been sort of front of mind lately because I, I just don't think it's fit for purpose in the ways that we've been doing it. Yeah, I think I think we're seeing it's definitely not fit for purpose. The fact that we have a housing crisis, the fact we have homelessness in a country like this is sort of beyond belief. Uh, I know when I tell people in Papua New Guinea they that we have homeless people, they can't they can't kind of comprehend that at all because everyone, no one's left behind. I, mean, I hate that type of term, but no one really is left behind in those communities. Um, there's some really great chats going on. Um, I just shout out to you, Howard, that you know you've. You've made, you've made some really good responses there. And I, I just think this conversation has to keep going. Um, but I think we're going to have to finish it up. We're coming close to 7.30. Um, but maybe one, just maybe some final comments, Alex and Louise, about sort of, I mean, you've kind of talked to it, but, you know, it can be so overwhelming this. And because we know it's got to be holistic, it's not just about a house or this, you know, it's it's a whole lot of things, including the climate and other things that we're facing day to day. Um, even there, I see, see someone saying, you know, as we get older, it, it find it harder to maintain an old house, you know? There's all these different things in there. So I thought maybe to end on a positive note, like um, maybe even if you're just relaying what you've said before, is like the importance of degrowth and housing in moving forward. Like whether there's one example or whether, you know, you're feeling actually hopeful despite probably not some of the great things we're seeing. Um, that'd be a great way to sort of end the session. Ah, Alex, <laughs> do you want to uh, <laughs> jump in? <laughs> well, like need... <laughs> you know, hope. Um, sometimes I'm scared shitless <laughs> by all of this. In fact, very good. Um, sorry, no. Um, but also, um, yeah, I do see hope. And, you know, the, the greatest thing that give, does give me hope, that culturally we put a lot of blame on particularly people in the global north people like us um we we think we think oh we're a terrible culture of consumerism the thing that gives me hope is that i don't really believe that i i actually believe that there is a really powerful structural imperative at work here which is kind of disconnecting us from each other and forcing us into very compromising market commitments and all sorts of things. And I think that when that's the basis of a society, when we're forced down that path, we get all sorts of terrible expressions of humanity from that. Um, so that kind of gives me hope and trust in humans that if we could just reclaim our natural heritage mm. um, of land and, and, and part of our natural heritage isn't just land, it's community, it's each other. We're also not products of the market or the state. I um, mean, that brings incredible innovation to land as many indigenous societies have shown us, um, incredible social and technical in innovations. Now, I think markets have produced wonderful things and, and we're, we're not gonna turn back from the sophisticated technical products that markets have given us. But we do need to balance markets in powerful ways. Now, markets are now have totally appropriated the planet and um, we're in trouble. We're in serious trouble. So the hope is that if people are given back an opportunity of each other and land, I think, I think people will take it up. Mm -hmm. I really do. I just don't think it's available right now. And culturally, we need to relearn about ourselves in community and in, on, and in common in on commons so that gives me hope 
um, in, in, I mean, all of you would have powerful stories and I'd love to hear some of those stories about land and the path, the journey you've been on to try and put a roof over your head and what it's meant in terms of, you know, your thinking and your ideologies and all these sorts of things. So I'll sign out. Thank you. Um, thanks for the time. I really appreciate being able to share this stuff. It's important to me. Thank you. Yeah, look, and I mean, seconding everything Alex has just said, and, and I mean, watching the video with your students, like that is just that, you know, that right there gave me a great big pile of hope. I was like, yay, you know, just hearing, you know, voices of people thinking about this and engaging with it. And you know, every time I see those little demographic charts that show the vote going green, <laughs> it's like, yep, that's, that's, that's all good. It's all going in the right direction but in, in a more practical sense I guess I mean we you know there's there's organizations popping up all over the place trying to do housing differently um you know we there's um as well as the the increasing reinvigoration of the call for public housing we've got you know, would-be community land trusts popping up um you know in you know a whole bunch of different states and seeing really nice leadership in this space by local governments and regional organizations of local governments who are saying we've got to do something better and responding and and you know responding to a community imperative and looking at okay what are the planning levers that we've got that can bring housing into the space and one of them there are community members saying look if this gets up we will put our homes into this we will actually stump up our own homes and say yep this this is how we start this so there's there's all and i'm absolutely in the, on the same page with alex like the things that people will do once they're given the opportunity which is why i always put up that photo of the dudley street board you know 34 people on a board working in this decades long process of deliberation to the point where they now have power equitable power to the city to talk about the future of their region in a decommodified frame and the city has taken up their vision as the vision for that part of Boston, you know, so there are things where and it doesn't defer into those politics of oh it's the state so they're going to be all controlling or oh, it's gone into community hands and they're going to flip it and do bad things like there's this really productive respectful dialogue and people actually just sitting down and acting like grown ups, you know, it's just it's great to see so and the way that it's blossoming across the UK and Europe and people, Germany just voted to, I think, decommodify. Oh, I can't remember. It was like, some, I, I'm hoping someone can Google really quickly, but it was like tens of thousands of homes. Um, you know, it was put out to referendum and, and it came back saying, yes, decommodify the hell out of our housing stock, um, put it back into state hands. Um, yeah, there's so many so many different ways in which hope is blossoming in this space and the more we talk about it and the more we talk about well what sorts of things do we want to pursue and how do we want to start upholding these principles and think about you know enabling all of life to flourish um you know the better steps we can make so i'll talk all night so i'll just stop <laughs> And thank you. Thank you. The chat has been awesome. Yeah. Alex think, and Matt, you've been awesome. Yeah, it's just been great. Oh, well, yeah. I want to thank there's, you know, a few people on this call, like Tony and Lisa in the background, who have done extraordinary work to make this happen, including Michelle Maloney from New Economy Network and, and many others. Um, it's all volunteer. This is how we can change. This at the moment is a lot of learning and discussion. And I think as part of the degrowth network, we want to build the awareness but we want to start putting this in practice to practice so um, I just want to thank everyone for coming or the questions or the chats it's been really insightful for me as well um, and that uh, make sure you come to the next degrow sessions um, I'm just going to put them here in the chat we've got uh, we've got another three so we've got tomorrow um, at 12, I haven't put the times there, but 12 p.m. I'm actually going to be speaking on degrowth and energy along with Marisol uh, Salinas. Um, and then there's another session, I think that's at 6 p.m., degrowth and food systems. Um, and then Friday, and I'll just check what time that is, sorry. Uh, I think that is 12 p.m., am I right, Anissa? Um, 
And that one is on where to from here, which I think is, you know, a really good discussion. I hope everyone can join that. So thank you very much. I've also put in there, you know, do reach out. I think it's in there. I put in some, yep, I put in our emails, degrowthnetwork at proton.me and nina at neweconomy.org.au. We really welcome people to our meetings. Um, you can email us about any questions and yeah, please keep the conversations going. You know, I think it can be so daunting sometimes uh, <laughs> in terms of what we're facing, but I think, you know, what keeps coming back and resonating and what this conversation has been about connection to land and connection to community and, you know, that that kind of cultural heritage is, is about community um, and we need to bring that back and not just rely we're in so-called democracy. We don't have to rely just on an election. We, we should be actively working together every day so we can shift all those policies and we actually have the power from the ground up. So um, thank you, everyone. Have a great night. And, um, yeah, we hope to see you all again.